you come out here and you build something of great value, you can make it. That's what's amazing about Silicon Valley, and that's why you see everyone flocking towards Silicon Valley. It's really that place where there's this groundswell of smart people dedicated to using technology to solve very difficult problems. I was like, oh my God, people just think of these things and it just happens, and how can I build something? I just want to like build something from scratch. We come here ready to make something of ourselves. So when an African leaves Africa and comes here, we're coming here to do battle. Hi, my name is E, and I am Managing Director and Co-Founder of Flutterwave. And Flutterwave is one API for payments across Africa. Hi, my name is Jonas Beshaurid, CEO and Founder of Stackshare. Stackshare is the best place for engineers and developers to discover and compare software tools. Hi, my name is Bukola. I consider myself a connector. I build platforms to reach African audiences back home as well as here in the U.S. to tap into their common interest. This is exactly what I've done with Jandis. Mall for Africa is an online platform that enables U.S. and U.K. retailers easily sell into Africa without any hassles or worries. We also help people in Africa purchase items from U.K. and U.S. retailers without any stress. Mall for Africa started really with an idea. I was born and raised in Nigeria, so um, out of necessity, I guess, people, my parents and brothers and friends thought they could utilize me as their shipping company. There was one day in particular, I went to the airport and I had 10 suitcases. And I remember vividly the lady across the counter was a Delta flight. The lady across the counter looking at me like up and down like, you are not serious. This is not going to happen. So I decided to build an app. Jandus Radio started off with just word of mouth. Um, I sent it to a couple of friends who wanted to listen to live radio back home. We didn't have uh, a lot of apps that were catering to African content and radio at that time. So I sent it out to them and they sent it to their friends. And before you know it, it actually was a trending topic in Nigeria on Twitter for like, I think it was 12 hours straight. People were talking about, oh my God, I have an app that has over like 300 radio stations. I'm in Abuja. I can listen to Beat FM. Beat FM is the most popular station in Lagos. And they're like, oh my God, I could never listen to this before. Now with this app, I can listen to my favorite station now. You know, I'm working on a platform product, which is payments, right? And I started digging into that and realized like it was an absolute nightmare to be a developer and get paid in Africa. I'll give an example, like up until recently, if you were an Android developer in Africa, you had to put your apps up for free. You couldn't make money on your apps because there was no way for Google to pay you. We're not just enabling people the ability to increase revenue by providing them new means of payment. But we're also enabling them to access global technology services by doing so, right? That is revolutionary. The concept was, let's bring all of these tools that you use to build your company and your apps and infrastructure, let's bring them into one place and organize it. And other industries had done it. You know, Yelp has done it for restaurants, you know, TripAdvisor for travel and, and international places. So this wasn't really a new concept, but no one had really done this for software. If you think about it today, you know, where do you go for software decisions? It's still Googling around and it's mad. 
we were actually the first site to really do that. You know, there were other sites that were trying to do sort of similar things. They've done software views, but we were actually the first site to say, you know, share all the software that you're using. For an average entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, there are stages to what the venture funding cycle looks like. You have to start off with a seed stage. You have to be able to get people who believe in you early enough to take a risk in your idea. Every time an entrepreneur describes what they do, it usually has to hit the point of, I saw a problem, it was very unique. I had a solution, it was very unique. I was able to get, or I should be able to get somebody to pay me for my solution but I should be able to repeat that so many times that it becomes scalable and sustainable. I know people who have joined a startup that thinks it's gonna be the next big thing. And then you just wake up one morning and they didn't get the funding around and it's lock up shop and that's it. Happens a lot more often than is talked about. We hear about the Facebook and Google and Apple and all the other startups that are successful, but one out of a million succeed and the rest fail. Silicon Valley is probably the Disneyland of capitalism, is a good way to put it. It is a place where you can come and make your dreams come true and particularly in the technology space it's a really, 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 really a good ecosystem to get things done. Um, yeah, and of course part of it is venture capital, right? So people take risks here and you, you know, it's a place that is tolerant of failure. They're not looking necessarily for the steady company, they're looking for companies that will grow quickly. A lot of them will fail, um, they won't get their money back. Some of them will bring some money back and a small percentage of them will hopefully uh, bring a big return. The Draper Venture Network's mission is to be in all the places where interesting technology is being developed, where entrepreneurs are doing great things. Um, and right now, um, we have partner funds on all the continents except Africa. Um, so we're actively looking for a fund that fits the kind of profile we're looking for. They're investing in um, early stage technology companies. It's not an exact science. A lot of it's just character assessment. People who uh, are trying to build something bold versus like copying an idea in it for the long term, have the tenacity and ambition to see it through, uh, boldness, yeah. Definitely think e-commerce is a huge area allowing uh, Africans to buy products they couldn't otherwise access easily, particularly without having to build huge malls and you know, kind of leapfrogging uh, retail. Financial services is also, also a big area, fintech, anything around telemedicine, because um, you know, access to doctors is really hard in Africa. What everybody hears is you raise the 100 million, they say, yeah, but that's not success. Success is lasting long enough till you can exit, either through an acquisition or an IPO, and the money that the investors get in becomes liquid and fungible. So a lot of businesses I've seen don't make it out of the exit, and that means everybody gets washed out. You just spend seven, eight years of your life working on this thing that didn't pan out. The five or six most valuable companies on the stock exchange are technology companies that were once venture-backed. So it's a compelling story about how um, people that invest in high-risk ventures um, are able to um, move a society forward because they were willing to make the investment when those ventures looked, looked silly. Um, and one thinks maybe this could happen in Africa. We belong to the school of thought that, um, Af that believes very firmly that Africa's future will be built on the back of entrepreneurs. We are firmly rooted in bridging those knowledge gaps and making sure that the interconnectedness between Africa and the rest of the world comes in forms of capital, 
in forms of education and resources, and mostly its people and their ability to think and grow beyond what's currently attainable by using technology to flatten the, the, the playing field. A Zebracorn is going to be a company that's built in Africa, for Africa, and scaled in Africa. It could become a unicorn by going beyond Africa, but made in Africa, scaled in Africa, so sort of multiple African markets. And that's really what uh, distinguishes a Zebracorn. So the first piece of code I wrote was my freshman year in college. I was like 16. I took Java and it was a program to like animate some radio and I was able to code it and I'm like, oh wait, it works. Like I just wrote code. I typed stuff and I ran it and it worked. I got thrown into mobile app development towards like 2010 where I created a, an app that went viral in Nigeria. Initially, it just started off as just radio and nothing else. So I said, what about news? What about gossip news, entertainment, sports, health news? Then I was like, okay, we can make this a little more social. What about having people interact on the app? I'd always been into tech, you know, growing up, I was like the tech person within our family, you know, people would always look to me. So I'd always been interested in it, but I'd never considered it as a real career path because I didn't have someone that I could point to that was in that industry. Everyone I knew was, you know, sort of outside of tech. I started to look at the internet as this space where it didn't matter who you were, but you were able to reach the most amount of people. Hey, good to meet you, I'm Mark. Mark Zuckerberg was my hey. earliest influence. Yeah. I've continued to be influenced by his approach to tech because it's the perfect mix of social mission, right, and economic impact. It's not about building a big company, and neither is it about being an NGO and giving everything away. It's about building a system. Introducing Mall for Africa, a rep. So let's say you are in a rural town in Nigeria. Download the app on your preferred device. Find the product you want. Once you've added it to the cart, you click on our pay button. And as they say, that's when the magic happens. We take the content from the cart. We put it in our environment. And now we allow you to select where you want to have the item shipped, how you want to pay for the product. Once you've made the payment for the product, the product is then shipped from the site you purchased it from. It's shipped to our warehouse. Then we tag it and then we ship it out to you, um, taking care of all customs, duties, fees, and making sure everything goes perfectly right. When I turned 25, kind of just reviewing the five years, I kind of settled on this vision of the world that was about building the future of Africa. And for me, it settles on three things. So it's a, it's a remarkably clear vision of what I want to do. And it's very simple. It's people, it's platforms, and it's policy. And Dello is a platform for tech-powered growth. Its future will be written in Lagos, Nairobi, and cities across Africa. And that was what we did at Andela, right? Found really smart young people who were very motivated um, with high learning agility, taught them, paid them while we taught them how to build software, and then got Facebook and Google and IBM and all these companies to hire them to build products for them. This is Andela. So what Flutterwave is, it's an API that enables anyone from anywhere in the world to process any kind of payment across Africa. We are finally making financial inclusion real. Every time I went to one of these hackathons, I'd see a new API and I'd think, man, I should know about that. Like, there should be this one online space that has all the best stuff and feedback from developers and engineers and people actually building software, you know? I was like, man, this should exist and I should just go build it, you know? And, and so I just treated it as a side project at first. Um, at the time, it was called Lean Stack. Eventually, I got introduced to um, this guy named Nick Grandy, and he was the first employee at Airbnb. So we started working together for about six months. We built out the first real version um, of Lean Stack at the time, and then he actually stayed on as an advisor, and he was the first investor. So, you know, that was big. We had a hosting company that had malfunction in their servers, and they deleted the whole database by accident and had no backup. 
sadly, we had to shut down temporarily, but um, we're working on rebuilding. We believe the best way to solve this problem is to show you what the best companies in the world are using and why. The transition was it's like realizing that the best thing we can do is try to mimic an in-person conversation between two people, the two engineers, right? It's like, okay, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Oh, okay, well, we don't have good visibility into how our app is performing in production. Okay, well, um, here's what we use, right? Like, here's how we solve that problem, right? And you tell them what you use, and then, like, <laughs> within 30 minutes, it's like, okay, I know that I need to use that now because I trust this person. I trust their decision-making process, and it sounds like a good one to go with, so let me go with that. I have a passion for creating products that I am interested in and that I'm passionate about. It's tough because at the same time, you have to make a living. And being a startup founder, you don't always have the means to provide for yourself. I didn't have any of that, um, any serious investors. So after a while, I just, just to keep myself from not starving, I actually had to break down and actually get a nine to five just so I can provide for myself. I basically just kept at it because I saw the value of it and I saw that it was picking up steam. I, I could see it getting easier. So you typically wake up around 4.35 because that's when the first calls are. <laughs> My team all over the world, I try and talk to them as regularly as I can. I'll probably end around 12 only because I like to sync up with some banks and team members very early in the morning when they wake up. So it's, uh, it's a lot of work and not a lot of sleep. <laughs> Definitely, it's, it's a lot of work because the 9 to 5 does take a lot of your time. But um, always in your free time, even if it's an hour or two hours a day that you can find, I'm always doing that. I'm working on something right now, um, you know, that I'm, I'm hoping is going to uh, be very massively successful once I'm ready. You go to a venture capital in Palo Alto on San Diego Road and you say, hey, I'm trying to raise funds for my African company. And they look at you and they say, are people buying Ralph Lauren? Are people buying Louis Vuitton? Do they know who Prada is? So I think part of the challenge with the, you know, being black in tech is that there just aren't enough black people in tech. When you see all the big companies, they all have like co-founders that went to school together. And when you grow up with people that aren't in tech, you don't have the luxury of saying, okay, I'm gonna start a company and I know exactly who I'm gonna tag and, and bring in as co-founders or early employees. What role do networks play here in Silicon Valley? Um, I think it's a huge, huge role. It might be the distinctive of Silicon Valley how over time these networks have grown. Cold call somebody or send a cold email to somebody and say, hey, I saw this thing that you did, and surprise, surprise, they respond. There's a lot of work that has to be done, the cultural preparation of what to expect in the Valley. And sometimes it's the most ridiculous, mundane, simple things. Punctuality at meetings, the way you approach people, email etiquette business etiquette. It's the simplest things that have profound consequences within a cross-cultural scenario. Growing up in Nigeria, in, as an African in Nigeria, I have natural networks. I have cousins, I have brothers, I have classmates. I like to say I can get to the president in Nigeria, whereas in the U.S. I can't even get to my mail. If you are not from here, it's very difficult for you to have a social network. You have to create that social network yourself. We want to make it if you came into Silicon Valley and you're a well-trained research and development professional and you went to Stanford or UCSF and you were a specialist in what you do, you'll get a great job and you'll get well paid. If you came into Silicon Valley and you were of African descent and you knew nobody in the valley, it would take you a longer time. In Africa, I'm an Igbo man. I don't even know that I'm black because everybody's black. It's like asking a fish what is water. Um, so Silicon Valley also has the aspect of the fact that it's about 3% black, which a lot of people don't realize until they get here. Where I work right now, I'm the only female mobile engineer. 
I'm also the only black mobile engineer. Um, it's not something that I expected. The culture fit is still a big topic here. You wouldn't think that people can refuse to hire you because you don't fit into a culture. It's happened in small ways where, you know, you go to a meeting with an investor and you can tell that they 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 just don't want to hear what you have to say and you know maybe it's your venture maybe it's like what you're working on but sometimes you can kind of feel that it's it's just because of you and like your color and they're not even open to it they just don't have to deal with people of color on a regular basis from my perspective i just brush it off and i'm just like okay you know not for me let's move on if a company just invested time and said look we're going to sponsor you we're going to provide your visa your work visa to come to Silicon Valley and work for us, you'll have this opportunity, but they're not, they're not going that route. And you have to ask yourself why. There's talent, these people are brilliant. One of the ways to solve that um, is just making sure that tech is part of that pool of options for us. To make it the norm, right? Where when they see an African entrepreneur or you know a black founder, it's like, oh, that's normal. Hey, it's good. How's it going? I'm back to the inside. Yeah. How was the integration? Was it good? Uh, what you want to do as an African in the valley is really plug into as many networks as you can, because that's ultimately kind of how you find the people who are ultimately going to root for your success. I definitely see myself doing this for the next, you know, at least five to ten years. And I think anytime you're building a company, you have to be thinking long term. I'm also a realist, and I know that if the worst happens, right, we get to a certain stage where it's like, look, you know, we've we've sort of like exhausted all of our options, and this is the best we can do with this thing. There'll be something else that I work on. I think the biggest impact that an African entrepreneur can have on Africa is to be seen, be a role model. Be something and someone that people want to aspire to be like. Be successful. Thank you, Eddie. All right. Apple actually has a woman of African descent. She's actually Ghanaian. That's one of their top people in marketing. Her name is Bozema St. John. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. I don't want to fit in. Because I feel like when you fit in, it, you don't stand out. Come on, y'all. I love the valley, but I only love it to the extent that I can establish these networks between the valley and Africa that make Africa better. And I think that's ultimately the vision of Africa that, I, that we believe Florida Wave is going to enable. One, one Africa, starting with unified financial infrastructure. I'm doing seven figures, even eight figures a year. This is a really good idea and it's a good company to work with. My vision for Mall for Africa is bigger than Mall for Africa, it's actually Mall for the World. The vision is to help other emerging markets um, via a brand Mall for the World. And um, we've, already, we've already started doing that. We are sitting on a huge powder keg of potential in Africa. Over the next 20 to 30 years, more than half of the world's working population is going to live in Africa. It's the second largest continent in the world by size and by people. <laughs> I don't think there's any narrative of the world that is complete without Africa being a major part or player in it. For us, winning means being able to come back in 10, 15 years and say, technology changed Africa and you were in part of the, one of the greatest wealth creation, value creation opportunities in modern history. That's what we need. Okay. Hello? Hey, how you doing? Hi everyone, uh, since we last met, uh, we have made a lot of progress and done a lot of great things. We're under a new name called Mall for the World, which is same thing as Mall for Africa, but uh, outside of Africa. I have released a new app called Afrocast, and basically it's a podcast aggregator for millennials. So far we are in beta, 
Uh, we have over 300 users, so I'm really excited about that. We launched a new jobs platform that allows engineers to essentially find jobs based on the technology they're familiar with. We've had uh, our best month ever um, in terms of traffic. Um, we were also featured in Software Development Times, uh, online magazine uh, for engineers and developers. Flutterwave has been, has been doing really well. Since that time, we've more than 10 times our total process volume. So we do about $500 million in total process volume. And we do more than $100 million in total process volume every month. Come back to the West Coast.